Support structures and machines. So this unit is going to be a little bit different in that instead of looking at the forces on just one single solid object, we're going to be analyzing systems of several connected parts. So you have a bunch of beams connected together, lever arms connected, and we will <clears throat> break these into truss structures, frames, and machines. Let's just define the difference between a truss, a frame, and a machine. So a truss is a structure that is created with two force members. Two force members is where you only have forces applied at two points, and this gives us the advantage that everything in here will be in straight comp compression or straight tension. A frame is created with three force members. So you have a force at C and another force at E and another force at F. And when you have three or more forces being applied to a solid object, that introduces the possibility for moments. So it's no longer in straight tension or compression anymore. You have moment calculations going on. And so this is a new category of structures to analyze. We'll also look at machines. So machines have moving parts, and the point of most machines is some sort of mechanical advantage going on. So you have a large force over here created by a small force over here. You're looking at lever arms. Large R, small force, small R, large force. We'll also go through external versus internal forces. Up to this point, we've only dealt with external forces. In order to solve for what's going on internally, which piece of this is under the most stress and strain, which one is gonna break the most, we're going to kind of dissect each of these systems and we will look at it first as a whole and solve for external forces at the supports. And then we will take it apart and we can find out what the internal forces are holding it together. Something for internal forces, these happen in equal and opposite pairs, which is why when you look at the system as a whole, all of the internal forces cancel out. So you have little equal opposite pairs acting at each point on the inside of the system. And it's not until you tear it apart and define your system boundary as a smaller chunk of it that you have to start looking at those internal forces. Just a quick discussion on how all of these members are connected to one another. Instead of using a truss plate, we are going to assume that everything is connected as a pin. And you don't really want to apply a twisting moment on these connections. And so just assume that these guys are connected with pins, in which case you can add up forces in the X and Y directions, but as we analyze these joints, we will not have to worry about moment calculations because pins, you can rotate around a pin. They don't fight against rotational motion. So it's just an FX, FY, and that translates into internal forces that are only tension or compression. If it's gonna fail by buckling and bending, that's something that's in compression or if it will fail by getting torn apart like a piece of taffy, that's something in tension. Remember all of these, there's internal, those internal forces happen in equal and opposite pairs. And so sometimes it's confusing to think about, well, what's the force acting on the member versus what's the force acting on the joint? And use that definition of compression and tension. If, if you can replace it with a, a simple string and it would still be structurally sound, that would be something in tension. If you would not be able to replace that piece of it with a string, if it would collapse, if that chunk was a string, that means that little section is under co a compressive load. So think about how it will fail and that'll tell you tension or compression. You're going to want to study some of the different truss designs that are used out there as you decide how to construct your bridge. Let me just walk through a couple of these structures and we can talk about the advantages and disadvantages of each. Here is the Pratt structure, the Howe, and the Warren. 
Now, if you look at these, they're not too different from one another at first glance. Now, the Pratt has kind of this V coming down. The how is a mirror image of that, where we have these structures coming up. And the Warren is made up of a bunch of equilateral triangles with all diagonals and no straight verticals. Looking at these three designs, if you're going to make your spaghetti bridge, what would be the best choice here and why? And there's definitely a better choice here. To design your bridge, you want to create something that's going to be hard to break. Let's consider just one member of the bridge. So consider a pencil and how you would go about breaking a pencil. Would it be easier to break a long pencil or a short pencil? Would it be easier to break the pencil if you played tug of war with it and pulled straight in tension? Or is it easier to break a pencil if you bend it and apply a moment to it? So obviously the longer the pencil is, the easier it is to break. And this comes from your moment arm. M equals R cross F. The larger the R you have, the larger the moment you have, the more internal bending is going to happen, the easier it is to buckle, the easier it is to break. So you want to avoid having really long members in your bridge because these are going to be easier to break. And also, if you have the choice of putting something in tension versus putting something in compression, you'll get a lot more out of something if it's loaded in straight tension. Considering that, let's go back to our bridges. Which of these is in tension and which of these is in compression? We're going to go through method of joints and method of sections. Remember, tension is something that could be replaced by a rope and it would still be fine versus compression you would not be able to replace with a rope. If we loaded these bridges in the middle and the supports at the end would then take half of that load, for the Pratt, and we'll go through this in the future of why this would be. In this case, all of the diagonals here end up being in tension. You could replace these with a rope and it would be fine. Consider that the diagonals, this is the long piece. So the longer the member, the easier it is to break. And you want those long pieces to be in tension because it's harder to break something in tension. The how which is pretty much the same as the Pratt. It's just a mirror image, right? So you have this V coming up instead of the V coming down. But when you put that V going up, you've now swapped around which of these internal members are in tension and which are in compression. In this case, you have a little Roman arch kind of a thing forming here so that now these diagonals are in compression instead of tension. So the how is not as good of a design. This is a worse design because the long members are in compression and that means they're going to buckle and this design will not hold as large of a load. For the Warren, you end up with half of the members in tension and half in compression. So here you would have kind of an arch that's supporting those forces acting around here. So you still have diagonals that are longer, that are in compression. So between these three truss structures, the best design, the best use of your limited resources would be the Pratt structure. So you can play these games, putting things in tension and compression and how you arrange your materials so that you can have the most efficient, structurally sound truss structure that you can. Here's a couple more comparisons. If we take that Pratt design and try and strengthen it just even a little bit more, how could we take these long members? Remember, the long members are where you're going to run into trouble. That's going to be the easiest ones to break. So maybe we add a couple more truss structures. So see this V coming down? It's still the same V, but the Baltimore tries to further support those long members by adding in just a little bit more of a supportive truss in there. Here's another alteration of the Pratt design. Again, you have the V. In the Parker truss, 
you're going to replace this straight top with kind of this polygon. And the brow string, the polygon turns into a round arch. And think about why a polygon would be a better use of materials versus an arch. As we get into the shear and bending moment diagrams, the larger your radius, the larger your bending moment. So you don't need as much material over here where you have a, a short arm. Where you need the most support is in the center of the bridge. The center of the bridge is where it's going to bend and break. And so the best utilization of materials is not to put a bunch of materials at the end where it's not going to break, but to concentrate on the center of it. And you do that with either a polygon or an arch. Now getting this nice curved surface, this is pretty hard to do. It's much easier to get a bunch of short straight segments. And so the Parker Tress would be easier to build than the bowstring, even though the bowstring, this would actually be the most efficient design. But that, that perfect curve is kind of hard to achieve. And you can try all of these out with, with spaghetti noodles and they'll fail just like the real thing. Here's a couple of more designs. Here's the lenticular tress. It's kind of a lens design where you have, and you can put that arch on the top of your structure or underneath it. Usually you have boats and cars and things trying to go underneath your bridge, so you're not going to put your support structure underneath it. You'll put the support on the top of it. Here's a lattice tress, probably not the most efficient material-wise. Again, the cheapest design is going to be the best, so you want to use the least amount of material that you can for these things. Here's the K-truss structure. You see that V coming down again, but we've avoided a long diagonal by now taking it up to the top as well. We had one year we had a K truss bridge that won. Here's the Whipple with some cables that are going to strengthen it. Okay, simple trusses are made with a bunch of triangles. If you don't have a triangle, Remember, these are pin supports. They can't fight against rotational motion. So you have to get something that will support a load with straight compression or straight tension. In this case, can you tell what would be tension and which would be compression? This member would break by buckling, so this is compression. If this wasn't here, it would do the splits. This is in tension. You could replace AC with a rope and it would be just fine. So compression, compression, tension. If you just attach a bunch of triangles to one another, that is going to be your simple truss. So everything is a two force member and you end up with lots and lots of triangles here. First, we're going to go through what's called the method of joints in which we analyze the structure joint by joint and make sure all the forces on each little pin add to zero. To solve these problems, first you're going to take your structure as a whole and solve for the support reactions and they're always going to give you rollers on one side and a pin on the other side that reduces your unknowns to only three unknowns and this lets you have fx, fy, and moment, three equations, three unknowns, and you can solve for the forces at point A, the force at point H, as a function of the load, the external load that's applied to the whole system. So this is the first step, is solve for what reactions are happening to, to support that structure coming from the ground. The next part of this, you're going to dismember your bridge and each piece of it you will draw a free body diagram of. Now you can draw the forces acting on each joint. That's going to be equal and opposite to the forces acting on each member. So if a member is in compression, that means it would be pushing on the pin. 
And it's, it's easiest to just draw free body diagrams of each of these little pins that's holding it together. Ask yourself, is the member in tension or in compression? Remember, compression means it's going to buckle. Tension means it's getting pulled apart like taffy. And for each little pin, you're going to draw all the forces acting on each little pin and make sure they add to zero. Because the pin is a point, we're not calculating moments. We're only looking at Fx and Fy adding to zero for each pin. That means in any given bridge structure, you can add together the number of pins. And for each pin, you have two equations. So that's the number of unknowns you can solve for. So the n is the number of joints. And you have two equations for each joint. So that would tell you how many unknowns would be analytically solvable for this type of system. A couple of different patterns you should pay attention to. If you have four members coming together at a point, the forces for that member, in order to maintain equilibrium, what you'll have is equal and opposite forces for the members going in the same direction. So FA is going to be equal and opposite to FAD. Up is going to be equal and opposite to ZAM. It's going to have to create one of these little parallelograms. So that'll give you information on the direction of this. Again, these are two force members. The force is in the same direction as the member. If you have something that comes together at a T, in this case, AC would have to be zero because there's nothing over here balancing it. The only way that there would be a force in AC is if there was an external force applied at A. So anytime you see a T, you can look at that member and say that's not actually supporting anything because DA and AB, those would have to be equal and opposite to one another in this case. Anything that's coming together at a corner, both of these guys would have to be zero unless an external force was applied. If they're lined up with one another, they're going to be equal and opposite coming together at A. In this system, just how everything is loaded together, everything in green would be a zero force member. K is a zero force because there's nothing underneath it fighting back. And so this member is not supporting any force. And if KJ is not supporting any force, that means JI is also not supporting any force. You say, well, why even have it there if there are zero force members? Well, let's say in the future we have some other external force applied at J. In that case, they would light up and they would start doing something. But for this particular loading, the green members are zero force members and are not doing anything. Can you tell why C is a zero force? If you look at B, you say, ah, but there's an external force at B. If you come and just look at C, though, anytime you see a T where there's nothing underneath it to support it or fight back, the force at C has to be zero. Let's just draw the force at C, OK? So here is C. And what do we have? We have something in the x direction for CE, right? And we have something in the x direction for CA. So those are both in the x direction. They're going to have to be equal and opposite to one another. And then for CB, if you had something here in the y direction, but there's, there's nothing underneath here. There's nothing underneath here supporting it. So that means that this chunk of it has to be zero because there's nothing underneath it that could balance those forces. So any time, like over here, any time you see some kind of a T coming together, that means that this would be a zero force member in there. Okay, so that was kind of an overview of just some of the basic ideas of what a truss is, what a frame is, what machines are, how we're going to tear these parts into sections, 
Next videos I'll do will be some individual examples, and this might be still confusing a little bit right now, but hopefully the, the examples in the next video will help you understand it a little bit better.